Welcome to Knowledge Book Radio with Marge Patasek. Marge was searching for the purpose of her life and the truth that would tie everything together to make sense of what was taught and what was happening on our planet, the fire that was creating all the smoke. Through many experiences, she was finally led to the knowledge book that provided all the answers. Marge is now talking about this gift to humanity on Knowledge Book Radio, so all can be united in peace, love, and harmony. This live call-in show at 1-800-930-2819 is amazing. So get ready to hear about the Knowledge Book. Here's your host, Marge Potasek. Hello, everyone. I'm Marge Potasek, and you are listening to the Knowledge Book Radio with Marge Potasek on Transformation Talk Radio. And as we've been doing for a while, for the next hour, we will continue our series of Omega Talks. And these are usually given at the end of the month, and this is part of the unification program of the Call to Friendship Association that is actually mentioned in the Knowledge Book in about three places, as far as I remember. Now, in these talks, what we are doing is connecting science and spirituality by discussing world knowledge and connecting it to the Omega Dimension. Now, the Omega Dimension, as you may know from either reading the Knowledge Book or listening to this program, is the 19th dimension, and this is a dimension that has been opened to us through the Knowledge Book for the first time in this time period. And the world knowledge we're going to talk about today is our skin. But before we go on, just want to remind everyone that our website, the Knowledge Book website for the United States is www.usa.thenowledgebook, all one word, dot net. The Turkish World Brotherhood Union website is www.dkb-mevlana.org.tr. That's www.dkbdavidkiteboy-mevlana.org.tr. Of course, you can contact me by texting or calling at 973-787-7035. Again, 973-787-7035. And of course, you could also reach out through my email, which is mmjp99, Mary Mary John Peter 99 at gmail.com. And the Call to Friendship website, the general website is www.calltofriendship.org. Now, please do text me, call me, or email me with any kind of questions that you may have that comes about because of today's program or any other program that you may have listened to, this show or previous show. And, of course, if there is a topic that you would like to have covered, either as a Omega Talk or another one of the radio programs, please do text me, call me, or email me. And, of course, any kind of questions are very, very welcome. Okay, so let's start on skin. We all have it. Don't think much about it. We just carry it with us wherever we go. And the skin does its stuff without us thinking about it. And a lot of times us not caring about it because it's there and we take it mostly for granted. So when we actually think about body organs themselves, we think of the heart, we think of the brain, we think of the stomach, we think of the lungs. And these are all internal organs. This is something that is inside, encased in the skeletal skeletal structure, um, and it's inside the body. But, and even though it may seem a bit strange, we also have an external organ. Um, And that turns out to be our largest organ. So adults have something that may be 8 pounds, or 3.6 kilograms, and the square footage is 22 square feet or 2 square meters. So this is quite heavy and quite extensive when you think about 22 square feet. So this is a fleshy covering, and it does a lot more than make us look presentable. In fact, without it, we literally evaporate. So, of course, the skin covers our arms and legs and torso and everything, And it shields us from outside forces. So, 
What does the skin do? It acts as a waterproof insulating shield. It guards the body against extremes of temperature, damaging sunlight, and harmful chemicals. It also exudes, it also gives off antibacterial substances that prevent infection and make vitamin D for converting calcium into healthy bones. So even though we may think we may be doing ourselves a big favor by using antibacterial soaps, we may actually be harming ourselves because we may be getting rid of all that good bacteria that we have on our skin that helps us. Now skin, of course, when we think of and we go on the road and we see um, you know, the t cell towers or communication towers with all those sensors hanging out, our skin is actually one huge sensor that's packed with nerves for keeping the brain in touch with the outside world. And this, all it does for the protection, the keeping our insides in and the outsides out, <clears throat> the temperature regulation, everything, it does this by being flexible. So it's not like a suit of armor that is unmovable and unwieldy. Our skin is very flexible. That gives us free movement and therefore it proves itself as an amazingly versatile organ. So where most of our organs, uh, like the heart, like the lungs, like the stomach, have a particular function, and are limited to that function. In other words, the brain cannot do the heart's work and the heart cannot do the brain's work. Uh, the skin basically is versatile and doing many functions at once. So what the skin is composed of? Well, number one, it's got three layers. The outside is the epidermis and that's the outermost layer of skin. And this is a waterproof barrier that creates our skin tone. Then the layer below that is the dermis. It's beneath the epidermis and it contains tough connective tissue, hair follicles and sweat glands. And then the lowest layer of skin, this is the deeper subcutaneous tissue or otherwise known as hypodermis. That is made up of fat and connective tissue. So we've got three layers basically. So let's go a little bit deeper into each one of these layers. The epidermis or the outermost layer this actually consists of many cells called keratinocytes. And this is made from a very tough protein called keratin. And this is the same material that's in our nails, in our hair, and the outside casing of the armadillo, and the outside casing of a, a turtle or a tortoise. This is all made from keratin, and so is our outermost layer of skin. Now, this forms several layers that constantly grow outwards as the exterior cells die and flake off. So it takes about four weeks for newly created cells to work their way up to the surface. Now this layer of dead skin is known as the horny layer. And how thick this horny layer is actually changes depending on where in the body it is. And the soles of our feet are more than 10 times thicker than the cell than the skin layer of the dead tissue around our eyes. And the actual epidermis also has specific cells called the Langerhans cells, which actually lets the, our immune system know that there are viruses and other infectious ages about. So it's also an alarm system, like a fire alarm or a um, carbon dioxide alarm that we have that alerts dangerous conditions as far as um, infections are concerned. Then the second layer, of course, no, the outer layer, the epidermis, they also have other functions as well. What, it's also called a melanocyte. These are cells that produce and store a black pigment called melanin. Now, when we get a sunburn and we're out in the sun, more melanin is produced and therefore our skin gets darker. And this darker layer of skin then protects the skin from the sun's harmful UV rays, ultraviolet rays. So um, then we also have lymphocytes and Langerhans cells. And these have a job in fighting germs by grabbing the germs on our skin and taking them to the next lymph, ne nearest lymph node 
to eliminate them from the body so that it will not cause sickness in the body. Then, there, of course, there is also something called Merkel cells. And these are very special nerve cells in the skin that allow us to sense pressure. Now, of course, our, especially our fingers are very, very sensitive to any kind of touch and any kind of pressure. Now, the second layer, or the dermis, is very tough and it's got an elastic collagen, elastin fibers that makes the skin very strong and robust, but at the same time allowing it to be flexible. So they're basically inside that skin layer like a crisscross, all kinds of V-shaped, uh, long, thin cells that connect everything. And this is part of what we lose as we age because the, the uh, collagen and elastin fibers start to not be as effective and therefore the skin starts to sag and drag over our, you know, our face and wherever. In a place where skin is stretched a lot and the skin can stretch, let's say if someone is, if a woman is pregnant and of course the belly grows or we grow new muscles, sometimes the dermis might tear and then what shows up on our skin are stretch marks. Now, of course, the dermis contains a network of nerve fibers and receptors that perceive touch, temperature, and pain and relay them directly to the brain. Actually relaying them to the brain. Now, some nerve connections are made directly to the brain so that when we, let's say, touch a hot, very hot thing or a very cold thing, we immediately, the muscle immediately reacts and pulls our hand away from the danger and because it would take a lot longer for the, the signal to go to our brain and then from our brain to our hand to snatch it away. So there are very specific cells that allow immediate reaction to um, fire and extreme cold. Skin also contains very small blood vessels called capillaries, and that allows us to be able to regulate our body temperature and allow nutrients and oxygen in the blood to pass from the capillaries into the cell, thereby feeding them and being able for everything to be hydrated, for everything to work properly. Now, of course, the bottom layer, or the hypodermis, also called the subcutis, or the subcutation layer, that's the furthers into the skin layer of the skin. Now, this is mostly made up of fat and connective tissue. Now, in the subcutis, between the folds of dermis that bulge into it, there are tiny cavities. And these cavities are filled with storage tissue made up of fat and water. Now, fat, of course, acts as a shock absorber, and it protects bones and joints from blows or bumps, and also, this fat cells serves as an insulation. Besides this, the fat cells also produce hormones. One of these hormones is vitamin D. And this vitamin D is actually an essential vitamin that is made when the skin is exposed to sunlight. So when you're actually exercising and sweating in the presence of sunlight, you're producing sweat, and that sweat contains vitamin D, and that allows any calcium that you have ingested to be able to be then used and built into bones wherever that bone is needed. Now, there are some facts that maybe we don't know or something new that we haven't heard about as far as the skin. So, the skin color, of course, is determined by cells in the epidermis, the outermost layer. Now, the cells that we've covered before, called melanocytes, they secrete a pigmented substance called melanin, and the more the melanin there is in the cells, the darker the skin is. You could have too little or too much melanin, and this, of course, leads to skin disorders or dis skin discolorations. On one side of the spectrum are conditions like vitiligo, which occurs when some melanocytes lose the ability to produce melanin, and that results in whitish patches on the skin. And albinism, which is a condition in which melanocytes don't produce any melanin at all. So these are people who are called albinos, and they have 
no pigment in their skin at all. And therefore, they also don't have any protection against the sun. And even their eyes need to be protected on a regular basis because their eyes are very sensitive to light. And of course, on the other end of the spectrum is hyperpigmentation. This is where you have too much melanin and you'll see a large patches of dark skin. Now, did you also know that white skin appeared just about 2,000 to 50,000 years ago? as the original dark-skinned humans migrated to colder climes and lost much of their melanin pigment. Albinos, people who lack melanin, are often cast as movie villains, as seen in The Da Vinci Code, Die Another Day, and The Matrix Reloaded. Robert Lima of Penn State suggests that people associate pale-skinned albinos with vampires and other mythical creatures of the night, because we are so unused to seeing a person with no color in their skin, it seems very unusual to us, so we say, associate these with something that's strange and weird. Now, did you also know that your skin could weigh more than 20 pounds? And it accounts for maybe 15% of your body weight. Now, based on that calculation and the data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, an average American woman that weighs 168 pounds carries more than 25 pounds of skin. And the average man that weighs about 195 pounds will have nearly 30 pounds of skin. And if someone has lost a tremendous amount of weight, there'll be lots and lots of skin just hanging loosely on the bottom. And sometimes when people go undergo an operation to remove that skin, that skin removal may be over 100 pounds that is being taken off. Now, do we also know that our skin renews itself every 28 to 30 days? The new cells that are created deep in the layer of the skin rise to the surface, and it takes them about four weeks to rise to the surface. And then, when they rise to the surface, the cells grow hard, and eventually they get shed. And this process, in which old skin is sloughed off and replaced by newer skin, might occur more than 1,000 times over the average American's lifespan. But all skin is not created equal. Its thickness varies naturally among all the areas of the body. Thickness can also be affected by age, gender, and habits, like smoking, that can change the cell's elasticity and other traits. The skin on the soles of the feet is up to seven times thicker than the skin on your eyelids. When you think about it, we need to have very, very thick soles and very thick skin on the soles of the feet because we're constantly on our feet and we do not want those, um, that skin to split. Okay, now, this is an interesting fact. If our skin sheds if our skin cells are shed every month, then why do tattoos stick around and become very difficult to remove even, you know, 20, 30, 40 years later? Well, that turns out to be a function of the immune system. When the tattoo needle punctures the skin, it causes inflammation in the dermis. This is the skin's middle layer. And in response, out come the white blood cells known as macrophages to help heal the damage. What the macrophages do is eat the dye, and when one macrophage dies, it passes it on, passes that pigment on to newer macrophages, and therefore the pigment is essentially transferred from one cell to another, which means the cell, the tattoo becomes permanent. Any pigment that is not eaten up by the macrophages is soaked up by the fibroblasts which are longer lasting skin cells and don't regenerate as often. Now to get rid of a tattoo, you need to have a very specifically designed laser to remove that tattoo. And that laser needs to be strong enough to kill off the macrophages and fibroblasts that hold the dye. So it's our immune system that allows us to have tattoos. And of course, right now the tattoos are very popular. If you want to get rid of them, you need to have a laser that's very powerful to be able to kill the macrophages. This is despite the fact that we slough off our 
dead skin cells on a daily basis. Now also, did you know that our skin is host to billions of creatures? What our skin does is become, has become a host to a microbiome that can contain more than 1,000 types of bacteria, along with other microbes, viruses, and pathogens. So we have tiny ecosystems on our skin, and these are mostly friendly bacteria that work in connection with our bodies for many beneficial purposes, including wound healing, reducing skin inflammation, and assisting the immune system to help fight infection. Now, previously it was thought that these bacteria, this microbiome, they thought that these organisms outnumber our own body cells 10 to 1. But right now, the current research says that the ratio between our cells and the microbiome is about one to one. So you have one bacteria for every skin cell. Interestingly enough, each one of us has our own very particular unique microbiome. No one's not, in other words, my microbiome is my own, somebody else's is their own, and they're both unique to, and we're, it's unique to that individual. Now, it turns out where before we had many different types of, of means of identifying people. Previously, of course, they had the, the, um, the measurements of the skull and the proportion between the different parts of the skulls was used for identification. Then everybody is, of course, aware of the um, fingerprints being a, as a form of identification, that everyone has fingerprints and that is individually unique to themselves. Now it turns out that they're beginning to think that using a person's microbiome is another method to replace fingerprints for identification since that microbiome, that collection of pathogens, microbes, viruses, and bacteria are unique to each individual. And here's another interesting fact. Ancient Egyptians put salt and other foods in their wounds. When you injure or break the skin's dermis, the layer below the epidermis, it can then expose the inner tissues to pathogens. Now, what the Egyptians used to prevent infections from going deeper into the skin and therefore into the body or fat or muscle, ancient Egyptians cared for this, for the topical wounds with salt. Yes, talking about rubbing salt into the wound, that's exactly what they did. They also put fresh meat on the wounds, moldy bread, and onions. Now, while this may seem like, ooh, what are they doing, and very unsanitary things to put on a cut, what they found in modern research is that there was actually some method to their madness that actually worked. When they put meat on a cut, on some wound, the meat has a high iron content and therefore it allowed the blood to coagulate, to form scabs. And that, they put meat on the first day of a wound, meaning on the first day of the wound when it was still fresh and, and likely to bleed, they put meat on it first to allow it to, to coagulate. And according to a 2016 paper in the Journal of German Society of Dermatology, they found that this meat, which is higher with higher iron content, was tested and they found that it worked. Now, when they're considering salt and onions, both of these materials are astringent, and they also can stop a blood flow. When we think about moldy bread, well, you know, this, this may be the original use of um, penicillin, the early form of penicillin. And again, moldy bread has an antibacterial property. And skin wounds, um, once they've been treated first with meat or salt or um, onions in order to seal the wound so nothing escapes from it, they would then put oils, fats, and honey and plant fibers on top of the wound to protect it. Now, when we think of our own individual microbiome and that part of that microbiome actually helps to protect us from uh, pathogens and germs, when we use antibacterial soap, as I mentioned earlier, we may be doing ourselves more harm than good because we may be getting rid of 
very good bacteria, very good viruses that are actually helping us to maintain our health. Now, when one of the functions of the skin is to keep our fluids in, meaning keeping the water that we have on the outside to the outside and keeping our blood and whatever fluids we have in our systems on the inside. And what our skin looks like is basically a brick and mortar pattern. So if you see a wall of brick, that's kind of how our cells are put together. Our skin is put together. So the bricks themselves are the cells and the mortar is the lipids, the fatty acids and other sticky proteins that form a watertight layer. Any holes in the skin where moisture can escape makes the skin more susceptible to damage, leading to dryness, cracking, and inflammation. Now, this is where people who have suffered burns often have fluid balance problems and can easily get infections. There are three kinds of um, burns in terms of they have superficial, first-degree burn, partial thickness, second degree burn, and full thickness, third degree burn. So in the first degree burn, the skin becomes red. Um, it does not have any holes in it, so it's still okay. But in the partial thickness or the second degree burn, there is some erosion of the epidermis, the outer layer of the skin. And in the third degree burn, this is where the skin is completely eroded and burned off, which means it's completely exposed. The un the the part that the skin had covered is completely exposed to the outside. So when we have, in this condition of the third degree burn, we have fluids that are coming out of the burned skin. And this is actually very, very dangerous because fluid loss can cause you to have to, for the heart to stop beating. And this is um, where in, you have a cut to an artery you can very quickly bleed out and therefore the heart can stop functioning because it cannot, does not have anything to pump anymore. So if we have a loss of fluid, it could also you know, cause the heart to stop beating. And this loss of fluid is usually prevented by our skin layer. But in the case of the third degree burn, that is not possible, and that's why any kind of treatment for a th for third degree burn usually consists of some kind of fake skin, some kind of fake cover to allow the skin to be covered and to allow the skin, allow the um, actually the body to be covered and not allow the um, fluids to come out and the germs not to come in. And the worst danger, of course, to third-degree burns is, is fluid loss and infections. Now, did you also know that certain skin conditions could also put you at greater risk for other diseases? Now, psoriasis is, has now been identified as an autoimmune condition in which the skin cells in an affected area grow rapidly leading to excess skin buildup, inflammation, and a red and scaly rash. Now, of course, leading or living with this kind of condition can and is uncomfortable, can be and is uncomfortable to live with on its own, but studies have now also shown that inflammation of the skin can lead to inflammation of other tissues and internal organs and eventually certain diseases. So, for example, Psoriasis has been linked to a greater risk of heart disease, diabetes, Crohn's disease, metabolic syndrome, and other conditions thought to be correlated with inflammation. So if you have psoriasis, it's probably a good idea to see what's going on with the rest of your body to see anything else has been affected. Now, of course, anyone who lives in a colder climate or even in warmer climates, we notice in the winter that we need to put additional uh, moisturizers on our lower legs because our lower legs get so dry. So why does this happen? And there's a biological reason for that because in that region of the body, there are fewer oil glands on our legs and lower legs than any other area of the body. Oil glands found near the dermis border with the epidermis secrete sebum that lubricates skin and hair. 
And as people age, the glands secrete less oil, and that also means drier skin. And in a winter when we have lower humidity and when we spend a lot more time in heated rooms, that allows our skin to dry out even more. So, of course, the best way to deal with this is to use more moisturizer and install a humidifier if you're living in heated rooms. Now, there's also another condition where, and that's a function of our sweat glands. Eccrine glands are found all over the body. These are glands that emit sweat directly through pores in the epidermis. Epocrine glands release sweat along hair follicles, so it's no surprise that these glands are concentrated in the hairiest parts of the body, the head, the armpit, and the groin. Both types help regulate body temperature. In hot conditions, the glands release water and fatty acids to cool the skin. Now, people who don't have enough sweat glands or no sweat glands, they cannot properly cool off and therefore are prone to heat stroke. So people need to be very careful, even if you have enough sweat glands. But if you're in an extremely warm area or, or very hot weather, we got to be careful that if we stop sweating, that also means that we need to make sure that we're not um, undergoing a heat stroke at that time. And here's an interesting fact, at least for me, that the bacteria and the, the um, organisms that we have in our gut, in our small intestine, and all those organisms that are on our skin are symbiotic, which means they're mutually beneficial to each other. Now, of course, the, the bacteria in our gut, in our intestines, and the bacteria on our skin never come into direct contact with one another. However, recent research has shown that the gut has a profound impact on the skin. The skin becomes very unhealthy when the good bacteria microbiome of the gut gets attacked by something. According to the study done by Gregory Maguire, Ph.D., a former professor of neuroscience at the University of California, San Diego. Now, of course, you can attack your gut bacteria by antibiotics, which means if you're upset there, you may upset something else somewhere else. So if you have taken antibiotics and then you find that inflammation, irritation, rashes, and pain come about, that is due because due to the fact that you've disrupted the gut bacteria. So and the bad and the good bacteria that you had on your skin therefore was affected by the by less of the good bacteria that you needed in your gut and therefore what you, the skin usually protects you against, which is inflammation, rashes and pain, um, got cut down. So there was a paper that was published in 2017 in the Archives of Dermatological Research. The same gentleman, McGuire, writes that normal gut bacteria can calm the body's response to stress. A reduction in the release of the stress hormone cortisol also reduces the chance of a skin irritation, all thanks to microbiomes in your intestines. So now, even though we're talking about skin, it turns out that our gut bacteria are now becoming more and more seen to be more and more important to overall health, including um, a healthy skin and healthy body. So there's another interesting fact. Skin cancer, as we may know, is an abnormal growth of skin cells. Now, the most common type of skin uh, cancer is basal cell carcinoma. More than 4 million cases are diagnosed in the U.S. each year, according to the Skin Cancer Foundation. Now, this type of cancer is colored pink or has a slight pearly white color to it and usually appears on sun-exposed areas of the face, ears, or neck, according to the Mayo Clinic. It rarely spreads to other parts of the body, but it can become very problematic if it is not treated. The second most common type is squamous cell carcinoma, and this now may appear as a pink or white bump, a rough scaly patch, or a sore that won't heal. The most serious skin cancer is melanoma, 
which looks like a dark, changing, bleeding skin spot. This cancer begins in the skin's pigment-producing cells, and although it is the rarest form of skin cancer, it actually causes most of the skin cancer cells. Now, so what does the knowledge book say about cancer? In fascicle 12, page 171, the knowledge book states, quote, the cause of this illness is stress. In the moment of stress, the secretion glands in your body impair your cell phenomenon. You cannot be aware of the change taking place there. Four, when cells cannot continue to do their actual mission due to atomic division, they call for assistance from each other in order to perpetuate their lives. From then on, those cells are a different kind of living being. They do not belong to you. From then on, they live symbiotically in your medium. However, since the toxins they discharge impair the electrical balance of your body, this leads to the phenomenon that you call death. In fact, when your electrolyte balance is upset, this situation diminishes your residual power, resistance power, causing death. Again, fascicle 12, page 171-172 continues, quote, The cure is spiritual strength. So if you have cancer, the most important thing to have is spiritual strength. It can be explained as follows. What you call morale reinforces your inner potential power, and this reinforces your inner balance. In fact, this is not a terrible illness, but the secretion of fear weakens the cells. It divides and impairs the tissues. In such a situation, focus your inner potential power on a thought that influence that area. In people who constantly take minerals, cancer is not seen. Iron, copper, chromium have the cobalt effect on the physical body. Mineral springs are the best method. Potassium, iron, copper, chromium must be taken without fail. Eat green vegetables in raw poultice form. Do physical exercise. Lack of physical activity is most detrimental. So what we see is that, number one, stress is a cause of cancer and that physical strength, strength is the cure of cancer. Now, to continue what the knowledge book states and gives as a health guide, in fascicle 5, page 69, it states, Do not eat unnecessary food. Do not waste your energies unnecessarily. Take the mineral salts without fail. The less you eat meat, the more vigorous you will feel. Obtain your proteins from seafood and milk products. Most of all, prefer apple among fruits. During this period, you will need plenty of oxygen. Do not ever neglect your physical exercise and your daily walks. Eat food rich in potassium to alleviate the stress in your nervous system. So how do we get physical strength? How is it that we are able to combat and cure cancer? And the Knowledge Book explains in fascicle 52, page 888, in this way, quote, The secret of the universe is the secret of the pyramids, and each human is a natural pyramid. Each human has special magnetic fields peculiar to himself, herself. The entire physical body is constituted of triangles of a unified field. Every human is a flower, that is, she, he is composed of a center point and six petals. These petals are connected to your brain coat. Besides this, each cell of yours sends vibrations through its channels to your surroundings from the electromagnetic medium of the body. The seven prismatic triangles of a healthy human should give out equal energy vibrations. A human is healthy in proportion with his or her goodwill, but goodwill should be in your nucleic essence, not in appearance. So in other words, our magnetic field needs to be strong, and our magnetic field needs to be balanced, and in this way we promote our health. And how do we promote our health? Through our good wishes and our goodwill and acceptance. Because anything other than that will produce strength, will produce stress, and therefore sickness and disease. And if we are afraid, that of course cuts us down because we are not able to fight off anything that we need to fight off. 
Now, um, there are some other facts that I think we need to cover about skin. And that there are at least five types of receptors in the skin that respond to pain and to touch. One experiment revealed that touch receptors that are concentrated in the fingertips and palms, lips and tongue, respond to a pressure of just 20 milligrams. Now, that's the weight of about a fly, which is, of course, no weight at all. Some of the nerves in our skin are directly connected to muscles instead of the brain, sending signals through the spinal cord to reach more quickly, to react more quickly to heat, pain, etc. So this is where the skin nerves are directly connected to the brain because otherwise, if the signal had to go to our brain first and then the brain had to send signals to retract your body part, then it would take longer and therefore that body part would be hurt already. Now, interesting also is that in blind people, the brain's visual cortex is rewired to respond to stimuli received through touch and hearing. So the blind people actually are literally, you're using their visual cortex to see the world through touch and sound. Now here's an interesting fact. An average person has about 300 million skin cells. And a single square inch of skin has about 19 million cells and up to 300 sweat glands. Our skin sheds 50,000 cells every minute. And that amounts to about nine pounds per year. So when you think how light the skin is, we shed nine pounds of skin every year. And some sources estimate that more than half of the dust in our home is dead skin. And when you think about the entire planet, dead skin basically makes up about a billion tons of dust in the Earth's atmosphere. So there's about a billion tons of dust in the Earth's atmosphere that's composed of dead skin cells. And we are actually breathing this in day in and day out. Now, did you know that fetuses develop fingerprints in the third month of pregnancy? Some people never develop fingerprints at all. And this is a rare genetic defect that basically carries, that leave carriers without any identif identifying ridges on their skin. Now, why are fingerprints there? Science has the belief that fingerprints actually increase friction and help to grip objects. Interestingly enough, New World monkeys have similar prints on their undersides of their tails, and they then are able to better grasp the branches when they're swinging from branch to branch. And so far, you know, through science, we've become aware that only a few non-human animals have unique fingerprints. So those animals that have unique fingerprints are gorillas, chimpanzees, and koala bears. And interestingly enough, the fingerprints of koalas are so similar to humans that even experts have trouble telling them apart. Um, look up on the internet koala fingerprints. It's very interesting to see how actually similar they are. Now, even at its thickest point, our skin is on average only about two millimeters thick. That's five sixty-fourths of an inch or 0 0.0781 of an inch. As we've covered so far, skin has a lot of different functions. It is a stable but flexible outer covering that acts as a barrier, protecting your body from harmful things in the outside world, such as moisture, the cold, and sun rays, as well as germs and toxic substances. Just looking at someone's skin can tell you a lot, for instance, about their age and health. Changes in skin color or structure can also be a sign of a medical condition. However, sadly, People have used this outer casing as a measuring stick for human high level functions like intelligence, capacity, work ethic, etc., and have created separation and segregation and prejudice. Did you know that the earliest recorded interactions between people of different skin color in ancient Egypt between 4,000 and 7,000 years ago, we see a history of felicitous trading interactions between people along the Nile, darkly pigmented and lightly pigmented people trading with one another and having mutual respect for each other's cultures. The earliest recorded history of interactions between peoples of different color, we don't see any prejudicial interaction going on, but simply an acknowledgement of difference. 
did you also know that what we see in Greek and Roman society is that slaves came in all colors. They didn't share the Greek and Roman culture, so they were considered to be barbaric and culturally inferior. Basically, as long as you're part of our community, as long as you're part of whatever we consider to be our civilization, anyone outside that civilization was considered to be uh, barbaric and inferior. In Rome, slaves, slaves were taken in huge numbers from Eastern Europe to man the agricultural plantations and the mines of the Roman Empire. Slavery was not just for darkly pigmented people. People from Africa were taken as slaves fairly late in the game. So how did this happen? There were some influential thinkers who played up racial differences. Linnaeus, the 18th century scientist who developed modern taxonomy, separated people into four human races and attributed various temperaments to each. The philosopher Kant wrote about the different races of humanity and claimed that white Europeans were the most talented race. These people helped lay the foundations for the modern world. Linnaeus was read by Kant, and those who read Kant were tremendously influenced by him, including Thomas Jefferson, other thinkers important in the formation of the U.S. Now, the Knowledge Book, of course, emphasizes that we are all brothers, sisters, that we all share the same genes as children of the Creator. The only differences among us are those created by our different evolution, consciousness, and energy levels. We all contain that spark of the totality, that mode of consciousness, that essence heart that connects us to everything and everyone. In Fascicle 7, page 102, quote, If you can embrace even your enemy with love, if you can think of sharing your food even when you are hungry, If you can ask forgiveness even from the soil that you trampled, then you solve the cipher of Mevlana. And, of course, the cipher of Mevlana is come, come, come. And that is the measuring stick that is used for us and to see how we have evolved until now. And to conclude, just as 300,000 skin cells unify to become one large organ, accomplishing the task of protection, humans will also evolve to unify and comply with the law of acceptance. And through the light photon cyclone technique and combined with our evolution on the path of the knowledge book, we will be encased in a magnetic skin, a balanced magnetic field leading to health that will only allow beneficial energies and frequencies and will block any forces that are harmful to us and we will gradually and safely become genuine humans. Now, now it's time for a short break. I'm sorry. We're running out of time, so it's time for a short break. And just we want to remind you that you've been listening to the Knowledge Book Radio with March Batazic. And to remind everyone that the U.S. Knowledge Book website is www.usa.thenowledgebook.net. Telephone number is 973-787-7035. And, of course, my email is mmjp99 at gmail.com. Mary Mary John Peter. 99 at gmail.com. Stay tuned. We will be right back. Thank you. Tune in to Knowledge Book Radio with host Marge Potasic each Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Through many experiences, Marge was led to the Knowledge Book, a gift to humanity in its transition to the Golden Age, and it provided the truth and the answers. She now shares information from the Knowledge Book with you each week on TransformationTalkRadio.com. For more information, visit USA.TheKnowledgeBook.net. To find answers to life's questions, you need to look within yourself. Dr. Glenna Rice brings your questionable conversations on Transformation Talk Radio each month. Tune in each month for insight into how you can live up to your full potential. Dr. Glenna is a physical therapist, certified access consciousness, and access body class facilitator. How does it get any better than this? For more information on Dr. Glenna Rice and her work, visit GlennaRice.com. angels and animals are always working for and around us. Darcy Pariso knew from an early age she felt this incredible presence that was confirmed for her in a Reiki Level 1 course. 
From then on, she has honed her skills and dedicated her talents to providing answers, inspiration, and tools for people to move past limiting blocks and past traumas to truly live a life of happiness. For more information about working with Darcy, visit DarcyPariso.com. What is a brilliant culture and how do we create them? Why are they important? Claudette Rowley has created a breakthrough five-step process to help you align your culture with your business strategy for exceptional results. Looking for a culture that drives organizational excellence? Listen to Cultural Brilliance Radio, the second and fourth Friday of each month at 10 a.m. Pacific and 1 p.m. Eastern on Transformation Talk Radio. To learn more or work with Claudette, visit culturalbrilliance.com. And we're back on Knowledge Book Radio with Marge Potasic on Transformation Talk Radio. Just a quick reminder, U.S. website, www.usa.thenowledgebook.net. Telephone number 973-787-7035 for calling or texting with questions, comments, suggestions for new topics, um, or anything that you want to talk about. And, of course, my email is mmjp99 at gmail.com, Mary Mary John Peter at, G- at um, gmail.com. So it kind of took off a lot of time, so we're running out of time, actually, this time. So I just want to summarize in this way. Cancer, according to the knowledge book, is caused by stress, and actually that is verified by science and is verified by research and experiments. And the fact that the knowledge book tells us that our well-being, our sunny disposition, our positive attitude actually reinforces our immune system and allows our immune system to basically get rid of anything that is not needed by the body that is harmful to the body. So positive attitude, what is a positive attitude? It is lack of negativity. And as long as you are in the law of acceptance, and the law of acceptance, of course, that we've covered in another you know, portion of this radio show, the law of acceptance is, in the law of acceptance, everything is positive. So no matter what happens, how it happens, what it looks like, we may think that it is negative, or we may think that we um, something is bad at happening. Everything actually has a purpose. Everything has a reason why it's happening. So everything is positive. As long as we have that outlook that everything is positive and everything is good and we're winding up to be good, then we will have lack of, lack of negativity and lack of stress. And of course, if we overcome our fear, then because we have learned the truth, because we know what's going on around us, we will not have fear, and therefore that fear will not cause these secretions in our body to weaken our immune system, to weaken our bodies. Now, how do we build a magnetic field to be a strong magnetic field? As the Knowledge Book says, uh, we are a flower, and our seven petals of the magnetic field needs to be balanced. That is done through reading, that is done through writing, that is done through the light photon cyclone technique of the knowledge book. Now, of course, the light photon cyclone technique, what it does is basically become our outer skin. Our magnetic field is our magnetic skin. And just like our skin protects us from all kinds of harm, keeps everything that's supposed to be in, in, and everything that's supposed to be out, out, the Magnetic Field of Knowledge Book does the same thing. It keeps all our good energies inside and protects us from any kind of energy, any kind of anything that come can come at us um, on the energetic level from harm. So, and we've got one minute left, so I need to be able to close. And um, so please do remember that there is a focal point in New York City. Please come and visit. The um, hours and the time is um, designated on the website. Please call to check what the time is. I think it's at 7 o'clock, but I'm not sure at this point. Um, We still do give out the um, three chapters free. And um, we are responsible for ourselves. We have tools in our hands, and humanity's verdict 
has been handed into humanity's hands. Therefore, we are holding our own ropes in our hands. And those ropes, we either will be able to hang ourselves or we'll be able to save ourselves with those ropes. And as the knowledge book states, and Mrs. Chirac frequently reminds us, you are the ones who will save the world. You are the peace missionaries who are building the magnetic field of the knowledge book in the United States and in the world. Thank you and good night. You've been listening to Knowledge Book Radio with Marge Potasek. Marge was led to the Knowledge Book, a gift to humanity, and it's time of transition to the golden age that provided the truth and energies and frequencies. Now, she shares information from and answers questions about the Knowledge Book with you each Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. For more information, visit Marge at USA.TheKnowledgeBook.net.